Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and in this episode we're going after the history of gaming with a Nintendo GameCube. Poor thing. Okay, super brief catch up on the history. So, mid 90s, the Nintendo 64 came out. It used a RAM bus system. It was a typical Nintendo. Nintendo had owned the consoles since the NES came out, really. The Sega Genesis was great, Sega Mega Drive in my case, but Nintendo was kind of where it was at. Nintendo 64 was competing head to head with the PlayStation. Nintendo really wanted to stick with this cartridge layout. It didn't go quite so well. The PlayStation kind of blew it away. I mean, on paper, the N64 was more powerful, but it was hard. The custom uh, RAM bus system for the N64 was hard to develop for, so developers could rarely take advantage of its full power. Come 2001 or two, depending on whereabouts in the world you are, the follow-up was the GameCube. Nintendo took the hint and they went optical. However, at that time, Nintendo were also competing with the PlayStation 2 and a new contender on the market, the Xbox. And this generation was a bit of a weird one. In theory, the GameCube was more powerful than a PlayStation 2, less powerful than an Xbox, so it had the edge on gaming there, in theory. But the PlayStation 2 had one secret advantage. DVD players. This was a point in history where everybody was upgrading from VHS to DVD, but DVD players were still expensive. But you could pick up a PlayStation 2, which was a games console and a DVD player, cheaper than you could get a DVD player. So meanwhile, you've got the GameCube that used 3 inch or 3.15 inch mini discs. And although technically they were the same format as DVDs, you couldn't play a DVD in them. With one exception, which we'll circle back around to later, I'm sure. And what gets really weird is when the Wii comes out in 2005, or 2006, depending on which part of the world you're in, and it's still largely a GameCube. It's got the same controller ports, it's got the same memory card slots. Weirdly enough, they've got nearly the same processor and RAM in them. 24 meg of SRAM, 24 meg of SRAM. Who'd have thought? There is a slight difference in graphics power. Three megabyte of RAM for the ATI custom chip. 64 megabytes of DRAM. So the graphics power has had a significant change, even though the processor and the architecture, very, very similar. I mean, let's gloss straight past the fact that the Wii actually has a full size DVD slot because it has to be a DVD slot so it can read the DVD games of the GameCube but still couldn't play DVDs. Why did Nintendo not take a hint? Anyway, let's get on with the teardown. First thing I know about the GameCube already is it uses game bits. So you may or may not be familiar with this little sort of round domed head connector or fixing with sort of uh, indents and you can get tools for them very easily, but they are completely bespoke to Nintendo. I say that. I think they're completely bespoke to Nintendo. You'll know them from cartridges, uh, NES cartridges, NES cartridges, I think the N64 cartridges as well, in fact. Yeah, the N64 is actually held together with them too. So it may be apparent from here just how many expansions and options for the GameCube were available. So these are serial ports and this one was high speed port. There are various add-ons planned. I don't know how many of them ever actually came to market. Um, one of my favourite add-ons was actually for the Game Boy Advance. There was an adapter I think that plugged on the bottom which then had a cable and port out the front for the Game Boy Advance and there were certain features in certain games that you could only get by playing on the Game Boy Advance and plugging them into the GameCube. Always found the inclusion of a handle a really weird thing on a, on a games console. Uh, in researching this episode I have found one image which seems to hint at why you would want that. So in the top we actually have active cooling, so we've got a nice little, what's that, 50mm fan, which seems to do the job. Obviously RF cage and some air ducting, guiding air across some fins, you can just see behind this grate. 
on the front, you can see a, that must be a clock battery. Like for a real time clock, I don't mean for a clock. That's got to be the reset switch, power toggle. Those two switches there just confirm the drawer is closed. Okay, back panel off. So on the rear, you've got a power connector and this little thing. Now this little thing, again, is actually basically the same thing as the N64, uh, to the extent that when I wanted to have composite out from my N64, I actually ended up buying a, a GameCube RCA adapter, which is just the same thing, and it plugged in. No adapters or modifications needed. Um, depending on the region, depending on what options you had available, I believe there was uh, S-Video in NTSC countries, in PAL you had a SCART adapter, and I think later ones had the option of composite out. So this front plate actually looks like it wants to come off as is. Soldered onto the front panel with a little ribbon cable, but... Okay, so you can see the, um, the one, two, three, four controller port and slot A and B for the memory cards. So weirdly enough, that six pin contact has got some vague similarities to the N64 controller, which yes, that's a whole topic for another conversation about the usefulness of this controller layout. Too much to go into right here. But that six pin, if you imagine these are coaxial, which I don't know if they are, but kind of makes sense if they were. Six pin and six pin. And apparently in some of the decompiled code from the firmware on the GameCube, uh, and including, uh, I think there's peripheral test disk, which is supposed to be for Nintendo official retailers only, but has of course made it out onto the internet there is an option to pick up N64 controllers. So like they kept that continuity going with the Wii, I do wonder if there was supposed to be compatibility with the N64. And when you look at the A and B button, A and B button, the C, C, directions, D-pad, single start stop button, two shoulder buttons, and then underneath on the N64, you have the Z button, which is now a Z button up here. You know, it really feels like there should be cross compatibility between the two. So let's just take this PC off the front plastics. It will have the controller ports. I'm not expecting anything like a real time clock module to be on here, but I think the battery location is there. You see, it's just spot welded in position, which is a shame because it does mean it's not replaceable. So next up has got to be the optical drive. And I, I still think it's disappointing they went for this three inch rather than the full size DVD. It would have been so easy and they obviously had the technology and the functionality in here to play DVDs because uh, Panasonic actually made the optical drives in the GameCube and as part of that agreement they had the option of manufacturing their own equivalent of the GameCube, which had a full-size DVD player. Now, it looks very different and somehow very similar too. Okay, I wasn't expecting that whole fancy unit to come out altogether. Power's coming in from here. That switch can also switch power to the fan as well as down to the thing. Well, that was a bit anticlimactic. So, how does the optical drive come off? See, the top mechanism here is vibration mounted on these little grommets, uh, but there's no full travel on it. Definitely don't want to break this. Should we take this RF shielding off first, then next screws up and see? Kind of interested to see whether the optical drive has um, standalone electronics, like, uh, I know it's not going to be a serial ATA connector or, you know, that kind of type of interface to the motherboard or whether the motherboard's actually got the controllers on it and it's just bespoke discrete signals that uh, control the optical drive. Okay. Wait, well I had kind of expected there to be some big ribbon cable between the optical drive and its controls and the motherboard but no we've got um, high density connectors which Makes me think that the optical drive is way more integrated into the console than uh, we've perhaps got the opportunities to do any mods or tweaks to. It should be worth noting, if you had a DVD format video on a an 8cm disc, 
it will not play on a GameCube. You still need a Panasonic Q even to get that running. I've got to say the gauge of this RF shielding is really thick. I mean, you don't normally get issues with magnetic screwdrivers sticking to RF shield. It's normally such thi fine gauge that you could almost peel it off like foil. Then I guess this is also the riser for mounting the optical drive on, so it had to be a little bit more robust. Okay, that looks like a reasonably standard DVD optical drive type controller to me. Okay, so that soldered connector actually comes to the um, optical sled drive mechanism. You can see just there how it moves the diode. Got the spindle motor in the center, which was this nice big ribbon, which also came off the front edge. And then off the back edge, that connector there was the diode focus and motion rig on the, uh, on the optical head. Okay, looking at the motherboard though, I mean, look at it. Tiny little thing. They've done a lot of very clever engineering to make it this small. Really nice high quality capacitors on here as well. Oof. Thermal pads still looking quite good. Okay, so we have CPU, which was like a 390 megahertz power PC processor. Um, this one actually named Nintendo is called the Flipper chip. Now that was the custom graphics chip that was developed with, at the time, Silicon Graphics, who were then bought out by ATI. And then these two ICs at the back are 12 meg SRAM modules. So that's 24 meg runs the whole system. That just seems crazy, doesn't it? And then obviously on the back of these clusters, you can see the two serials and the um, uh, high-speed interface. Hold on. There's another board in here. Ah. Okay, we'll forgive it. It's the power supply. So this is taking in the 12 volts from the external power supply and doing all the voltage regulation because this will need 5 volts, 3.3. 3, 3. It's nice that that actually sits on a separate daughter board. It's much more repairable in that way. So if your power supply becomes faulty, it's not the case that the whole motherboard has got to be thrown away. It's uh, a daughter board replacement, which is a great way to go. Now again, they've done fantastic work at miniaturizing this. That is a very high density board. I do make some clever stuff, old Nintendo. And again, a couple of RF shields, bottom plastics. Okay, the GameCube as a console was honestly a little bit forgettable. If you think about that sixth generation war between the PlayStation 2 and the new Xbox, do you really think about the GameCube? And I think it clearly showed, because you think about after competing head-on, Nintendo on its next generation took a very different tact of finding a gimmick, uh, a unique selling point rather than just pure processing power. And it's a shame because Nintendo have got some clever little features, some clever touches. I mean, the, the way this thing fits together in itself is very, very clever. Yes, it was a little bit let down by some questionable decisions. Uh, I, I think this would have absolutely killed if it had a DVD drive in it and the ability to play films especially since they've gone to the cost of putting the diode in there and the DVD reading hardware. It just doesn't make sense to me not to include that. And I don't know what the rationale was between omitting that and making this a eight centimeter only disc playing device. Why would you do that? Either way, some great little features in here. Really nice repairability, nice serviceability, well-designed hardware, let down by poor concept. Can I say that? Let me know what you think over on the Element 14 community, element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.